I'm Rick Rausch. I'm the Dean of the College of Agricultural Sciences at Penn State, and we are excited to have you here today for our College Connections webinar. Before we get started, please note that we are recording this session. These webinars are designed to give you an inside perspective of the diverse programs, people, priorities, and partnerships within the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences. Today's session is the Pasto Agricultural Museum, Connecting the Past and the Future, and I'm joined here today by Rita Grafe, who is the director of the Pasto Agricultural Museum. And she will share an overview of the many collections that the college has that are vital to our teaching, research, and engagement missions. After her presentation, we'll have a question and answer session, first addressing the questions that were submitted during registration. If you have questions during the presentations, please enter them on the Q&A link, not the chat, because it's easier for us to follow and respond to them in the Q&A. So without further delay, I'd like to take a quick minute to introduce our presenter. Rita Grafe serves as the director of the Pasto Agriculture Museum and the Arntory Respiration Cal Calorimeter Historic Site. She has 10 years of experience in collections care and museum education, and she's an advocate for collections in the college and across the university. She's a member of the Penn State Museum Consortium and on the university working group for broader impacts. The museum and her care engages scientists, practitioners, and the public in the importance of food and fiber production systems and the environment. Visitors explore the intersection of history and science through the programs, exhibits, and events that feature historic and present-day artifacts, inventions, and technology, and the work of research scientists. Rita is responsible for maintaining the collections, developing interpretation, designing exhibits, delivering programming, writing grants, fundraising, marketing, and overseeing facilities and operations. So in today's present conversation, Rita will share a glimpse of not only the Paso Agricultural Museum, but will also help us better understand the nature and importance of collections across the College of Agricultural Sciences. So with that, Rita, off to you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rausch. Let me see if I can share my desktop. And turn on my PowerPoint. Good. It's got it. You've got college collection connections. I'm not seeing it on mine, but you're you're good. All right. Um, well, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Uh, today, I'd like to share a taste of the collections that can be found across the College of Agricultural Sciences. A few are open to the public with exhibits and regular hours. Others are more teaching or research collections. And as we consider them as a whole, they represent a comprehensive natural history and cultural history collection that's vital to the teaching, research, and engagement mission of our land-grant institution. Oops. The Pasto Agricultural Museum has an interest in all these collections. As a public site, we can leverage these extraordinary but little seen collections to captivate attention, to build awareness, and share the groundbreaking research found here at Penn State as we connect visitors to present day science that's tackling today's big issues in agriculture, food, and the environment. The Pasto Agricultural Museum showcases the tools and technology of agricultural and rural life through the 1930s, from a 6,000-year-old clay sickle from Mesopotamia to mowers, reapers, binders, thousands of objects are on display at the museum located at the Russell Larson Agricultural Research Center at Rock Spring. That's nine miles southwest of University Park campus. The museum was founded by Dr. Jerry Pasto, a retired associate dean and professor of ag economics. The collection bears his name and his legacy endures in the work that we do to engage the public. We focus on how work was done in the home and on the farm at a time before gasoline engines and electric motors when human and animal power prevailed. Our hands-on exhibits, demonstrations, and tours connect the science and technology of our agricultural past 
with the present day for almost 10,000 visitors in a typical year. These are simply objects unless we make them relevant through the stories that we tell and the interpretation that we offer in our exhibits and programs. For example, when we churn cream into butter, we start with a cow. We describe the process of caring for and milking a dairy cow when we speak to a group of third graders in front of our 1850s hearth kitchen. We demonstrate how cream naturally separates from the milk like oil and water, talking about densities of liquids. We agitate that cream and show some of the many inventions that make this laborious work of churning more efficient. We read tongue twisters and sing songs to pass the time while churning, drawing from historic texts, and we'll reference photos and related artifacts like butter molds to help us unpack who was churning and why and explore what this all means to us today. A program called, Hey, There's Science in My Ice Cream, featured faculty from our food sciences department, sharing some of the science and history of ice cream, how ingredients, temperature, and the stepwise process of making the confection yields the delicious treat that we, of course, in our ice cream social got to taste. In addition to programs like our ice cream social, we're developing exhibits with, and programs with graduate students and researchers who are our subject matter experts. These kinds of projects provide our students experience crafting science communication and public engagement. These masters and PhD candidates can use these broader impact activities in their proposals for federal funding to further their own research. We use National um, Next Generation Science Standards, or NGSS, as a framework for developing programs for multi-generational families to think about some of the same questions that our scientists are pursuing. Dr. Rose Zhu's NSF Career Grant Award includes broader impact activities related to the Colorado potato beetle and toxicology work that she's doing. And at the museum, we worked with her and her lab to offer intergenerational programming for families who explored the physiology and life cycle of the beetle. We discussed the mechanisms that make controlling these insects so difficult in the field. We looked through microscopes at the antenna of the beetles, tested our own sense of smell, grew protein crystals, and a whole lot more. I hope that you'll look for more AgSci Action Labs coming this fall as we feature other researchers across the college. You can also see in the background of this image that the Pasto Agricultural Museum displays tools and technologies that got the work done on the farm or in the home. And we make explicit connections between this history and the science of the time to help our audiences think about present day agriculture from food and fiber to the environment and natural resources. While the Pasto collection contains thousands of artifacts, many on display and even more in storage, the historic Armsby Respiration Calorimeter is essentially a collection of one. Built in 1902, it became a museum in 1969. It was used in research for over 60 years. Pause for a moment and think about what technology has lasted that long. The calorimeter sits on Ag Hill at the top of University Park campus. It's dwarfed, as you can see here, by Patterson and Armsby buildings, but it's a big enough building. Our university library archives and special collections hold photographs and papers from Dr. Pre Henry Prentice Armsby and his contemporaries. We know that H.P. Armsby arrived as the first director of the experiment station in 1887, set up the Animal Nutrition Institute, later integrated into the Department of Animal Science, and ser served a short stint as Dean of the College of Agriculture. He proposed and built 
the Armsby respiration calorimeter as an important part of his research. We have the architectural plans and parts drawings for components that were designed for this cutting edge instrument. The calorimeter building is an engineering marvel. When visitors tour the site, they are walking into the scientific instrument, into the artifact. And today, visitors can appreciate the problem solving and ingenuity that it took to capture data about temperature change and the solids and liquids and gases that went into and out of research subjects in uh, Armsby and his colleagues work, subjects that were as large as cattle. Today, though it's no longer used for research, this historic site serves faculty and students in our college in animal nutrition, as well as health and human development, engineering and thermodynamics, architecture, biochemistry, biology, history across campuses and colleges. About those services, the Interagency Working Group on Scientific Collections, or IWGSC, I'll call it the Working Group, is co-chaired by representatives of the Smithsonian Institution and USDA. And beginning in 2005, they set out to examine the state of federal scientific collections, like the Smithsonian Collection or um, National Agricultural Library, and make recommendations for their management and use that could be applied across institutions that also collect scientific collections as part of their funded research. More recently, working group, this working group published a report on the economic benefits of scientific collections, describing the value of collections in terms of the services that they provide. As you look at this list, this is what we do with our collections at the Pasto Museum, at the Armsby Calor Respiration Calorimeter, and collections across the College of Agricultural Sciences provide these important services too. So let's take a look at them. The Frost Entomological Museum contains approximately 1.3 million arthropod specimen with strengths in sucking lice, about 15,000 specimen. I love this up close look. Um, dragonflies and damselflies, 65,000 specimens. Aphids, 224,000 specimens. And the associated data, field notes, manuscripts, and objects like galls, nests, and leaves with herbivore damage. The museum, the Frost Entomological Museum, exhibits thousands of objects, including entomological tools, collecting gear, historical artifacts, and insect specimens to share information about insect biology, their relationship to humans, and how our collective knowledge of insects and our interactions with them have changed through time. Collection objects are used extensively in educating people about insect biology, including their impacts as pests, as prey, and as organisms that inspire and compel us. Specimen are inspiration in art and graphic design courses, teaching students about natural history interpretation and historical and present day applications of Insect materials used in art, for example, silk from domesticated moths, carmine dye from cochineal, ink from wasp galls. Visitors explore the history of the field of entomology, how people learn about and study insects, and how people manage insects of economic significance, such as invasive pests or beneficial pollinators. The frost is a resource for teaching students about natural history interpretation. While the museum draws in over a thousand visitors from the public annually, collaboration with other institutions through requests for data, requests for loaned specimens, and visiting scholars also underscore the importance of this collection. We may not know who might find a collection interesting when we set out to collect it? Entomologists 
are examining plant specimen for the insects that were unknowingly collected when the plant was gathered in our pack herbarium. The Pennsylvania Agricultural College Herbarium is a plant, seed, lichen, and moss collection. It is the third largest herbarium in Pennsylvania, housing one of the largest and most important collections that documents the flora west of the Susquehanna River and how it has changed through time. In addition to its holdings of Pennsylvania plants, the collection contains 44,000 specimens from North America and the world. The collection has grown from 3,000 specimen brought by the university's first president, Evan Pugh, when he arrived in 1859, from 3,000 specimen to over 108,000 specimen today. The collection includes several special collections of type specimens, vouchers, and seeds. The PAC Herbarium conducts active research with the Pennsylvania, excuse me, with the Penn State Arboretum, the Morris Arboretum, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, and the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. The herbarium partnered in the Mid-Atlantic Megalopolis Project to image, transcribe, and geo-reference much of its holdings. The herbarium provides services to the university and larger botanical community, including research and teaching support, tours, and workshops, a series of virtual and in-person workshops is coming up this spring involving um, topics like woody winter plant ID, Latin names, some citizen science and plant identification. A voucher is a preserved specimen and our herbarium includes many of these. A voucher is a preserved specimen that serves as a verifiable and permanent record of wildlife as it preserves as much of the physical remains of an organism as possible. It's a critical part of documenting research activity. The Department of Ecosystem Science Management or ESM vertebrate collection holds approximately 2,000 mammals, 300 reptiles and amphibians, and 2,500 birds with approximately 2,000 uncurated specimens. The collection serves Pennsylvania, researchers at Penn State, and several state and federal agencies, including the Pennsylvania Game Commission, the Pennsylvania Biological Survey and its members, the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, and the U.S. Geological Survey. The collection includes 95% of the bird species in Pennsylvania, residents, migrants, and accidentals. Several specimens originate from the Wheeler Geographical Surveys dating from as far back as 1869. More than 300 bird specimens in the collection were obtained prior to 1900. The curated portion of the collection contains 17 specimens of mammals and 73 specimens of birds that are listed as near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. Other specimens of note include uncurated egg and wig wing collections and one of the most one of the largest series of Pennsylvania black bear skulls in the US. Imagine we wanted to compare insects in a Pennsylvania stream today with those that existed maybe 50 years ago. Poking inside of fish bellies is one really good way to compare the insects that a fish was eating today with what its ancestor might have been eating in that same location on that same week decades ago. And that's one of the things that the ichthyology collection or the Penn State University Fish Museum uh, offers. It houses over 1 million fishes in 30,000 lots. Major holdings include specimen from West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Lake Malawi in Africa. One of the largest holdings of fishes from Lake Malawi. The collection includes underwater video to delimit species by their unique behavior. 
The collection represents the largest collection of Pennsylvania fishes that's known. The collection includes voucher specimen from the Pennsylvania Fish Commission and US Fish and Wildlife Service Cooperative Trout Survey from 1970 and identifies over 100,000 fish species with corresponding maps identifying where specimen have been found over time. This illustration shows the variation in body morphology in cichlid fishes in Lake Malawi. The body of water in South America, Lake Malawi is home to between 800 and 1,000 species of this colorful fish that's most often seen in aquariums in the US. Lake Malawi is huge and deep, holding 7% of the world's available fresh water, while 10% of its cichlid species are believed to be endangered by overfishing for food. As part of a current project to revise Cooper's Fishes of Pennsylvania, curators have cataloged underwater video of most of the fishes found in Pennsylvania's water and have provided information about the unique behavior of introduced and indigenous fishes. Students and government agencies use collection related publications to study the impact of industrial development on the state's waterways, track human impact on the environment and on species, and have documented at least 50 now extinct species since a list of Pennsylvania species was made in the 1930s. An AgSci Action Lab, lab pictured here uh, for it, an AgSci Action Lab intergenerational program at the Pasto Agricultural Museum in 2019, shown here, featured the fish collection and one of its PhD students. The program trained participants to use a dichotomous key, among other activities. We had four year olds distinguishing between brook trout and brown trout. You can bet their parents were trying to figure out how to do it as well as their children. We may not realize what we have until we almost lose it. In the latter part of the last century, in the 1980s and 90s, some collections were discarded, perhaps thinking that we had collected everything that we thought we needed to know about a subject. But today, advances in science and technology allow us to look even closer, or perhaps differently, at artifacts in our collections. The Penn State Xylarium or Wood Collection began with a student collection and donation in 1909. The Xylarium currently holds over 11,000 documented and validated specimens, 5,000 or more yet to be documented of the more than 8,000 specimens recently donated by collectors and scientists. Using new technology in gene sequencing and modification, the Xylarium furthers technological advances in search of biologically derived treatments in genetics and medicine. Open and available by appointment, the collection is being digitized to allow extension educators to use it in programming for agriculturalists and arborists, as well as woodworkers. The American Chestnut Foundation supports research on the wood quality of chestnut variants and hybrids as they work to reestablish the American chestnut in North American forests. Future initiatives include research to formulate a chemical composition library of the 4,000 or more wood species in the Xylarium collection. Perhaps the most important role of the Xylarium, as well as other biological collections at the university, is the yet to be discovered as scientific instrumentation and techniques are further developed and as research advances. The Fusarium Research Collection. Fusarium is a large genus of filamentous fungi, widely distributed in soil and associated with plants. Most species are harmless, though some can cause some infections in humans. The Fusarium Research Center is a resource center for researchers and others working with Fusarium. It's maintained in one of our laboratories. It is the world's largest Fusarium collection comprising approximately 16,000 isolates of 50 species. Like 
the E. coli collection pictured here, um, these have very special temperature uh, conditions, very cold, and are not uh, typically open to the public. The E. coli reference collection is part of Animal Diagnostic Laboratory in the Department of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences. It is the largest repository for E. coli strains in America, holding more than 80,000 strains collected over the last 50 years from animals, humans, birds, and the environment. Characteristics of each strain are well documented in a database that can be retrieved easily. Cataloging collections is a really important part of their care. This collection is used for epidemiological studies, antimicrobial resistance over the years, related, uh, relatedness to uh, between strains and for molecular tracking. The International Verticillium Culture Collection is a culture collection in the Department of Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology. This is another collection with very special needs to safely house and maintain culture specimen. Did you know that Pennsylvania grows two thirds of the world's mushrooms? The mushroom culture collection contains about 12,000 specimens. Some date from as long ago as the early 1900s when mushroom culture really began in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. Cultivated, it includes cultivated mushrooms as well as the diseases related to cultured mushrooms. And um, also used in breeding programs are some wild strains that are part of the collection. The facility contains a spawning casing area and spawn growing rooms and climate controlled production areas. This is a living collection where the mission is not only collecting and preserving, but also sustaining these specimens. And the specimen require a compost growing medium for the spawning and sustaining of them. This composting facility houses a compost mixer, aerator bunkers, and uh, control that control the temperature and humidity for making the compost. These provide a unique opportunity to study not only the mushroom isolates, but the biology and biochemistry of the composting processes under very controlled environmental co conditions. So from tools to historic sites, plants to pathogens, birds to bees, this has been a whirlwind tour. I hope you've enjoyed this little taste of some of our collections and that I've whet your appetite for more. I invite you to join us at the Pasto Agricultural Museum during Ag Progress Days 2023, this August 8th, 9th, and 10th, where we will share a new special exhibit that features these many collections in the college. Be sure to visit our website, subscribe to our newsletter to learn about upcoming programs and events, and on March 28th, the Pasto Agricultural Museum reopens for the season. We are open 10 until 2 on Tuesdays and Thursdays from March through December and by appointment. I want to acknowledge my colleagues and the collections featured here, as well as others across uh, the college that are affiliated with the College of Agricultural Sciences. As a group, we meet regularly to coordinate and support each other's efforts. We recently collaborated to write a proposal to the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, for a small bit of funding to support a project that will help us take a more holistic and strategic approach to planning for the care and preservation of these collections while also providing broadest access to them. Dr. Rausch and the team behind the scenes and everyone here, thank you for this opportunity to share some of the things that I am most passionate about. What questions can I answer? Well, thanks a lot, Rita, that was amazing. Uh, uh, literally tens of thousands of specimens in various places around the college we, lo we look forward to the day of the much promised STEM museum where we can bring more of them together in one place. It's, it's pretty fantastic. Um, uh, Mary Worth has put up in the chat 
the, the uh, it put up the link in the chat to the museum website for those who want to follow up on that part of it. Um, so it's time for the questions and answers. And so if you have questions, uh, it could be that people may have put some up already, but um, I'll get back to that in a minute. If you have questions, put them up in the Q&A link and we'll start off with questions that were submitted before during the registration period. So the first of those was that Dr. Pasto was an instructor and acting dean, played a major role in the college and its development. What part of the program will be developed to him, devoted to him and its and his importance to the museum? Well, I'll, I'll say that one of the wonderful things that persists at the Pasto Agricultural Museum, and I think in the work that I do and hopefully presented here today, is Dr. Pasto's passion and um, whoops. Dr. Um, Dr. Pasto's passion and attention to detail. As I sometimes review our inventory of artifacts, I'm also often surprised by a label or a note that he left tucked in beside an artifact. And he recorded VHS videos of many of the artifacts in the original collection, demonstrating how they work and how they're used in the processes on the farm or in the home. I didn't have a whole lot of time to spend on the just the Pasto Museum today, but I hope that you'll join us at the museum um, to uh, share our upcoming exhibit that's coming up at the uh, in August. So I can see there in the Q&A, there are more questions about this, Rita, but we'll go through the original list still. So I know you're going to love this question. What's your favorite item in the, or items in the museum? Well, I think it depends on what I'm working on at the time. Um, am I still sharing screen? You see the picture I have up right now? I have, oh. um, because this picture came in in advance, I don't know if I can share screen. Let me do this again. Back in the Zoom. Where did you all go? How about that? One of my current favorites. Oh, Mary, help me. So you should be able to see a square, a share screen, little green share content. Yeah, I'm working on two screens here and I'm trying to get my mouse over there. Come on now. Ah, uh, that's because it disconnected. Let me come back here. Oh, gracious. There we are. Share screen. Let's try this. Now. I could see share screen coming up on my screen, but that wouldn't help you very much. No, nope. here we go. Ah, that's looking better. Okay, Is I can that... see the desktop there. Yeah, except I can't see it. What the heck? Let's try this. Well, I'm I'm gonna wing it. I know that I have three pictures that I put in my hopper to help answer this. These are my current absolute favorite because as an educator working in a museum that engages the public in thinking about, in my case, agriculture and agricultural history and science, I'm looking for objects that will captivate, capture the attention and hold it long enough so that I can share information about some of the current day best practices or dive into some of the issues that are very much the same or very different than the scientists that are um, pursuing research in agricultural sciences today. And what's more interesting and compelling than a mason jar filled with soil? Hopefully that advanced to the next picture. Um, we just uncapped. Showing, it is not showing the pictures. No. Oh, it's showing gracious. your desktop. Yeah. Well, that's screen. not helpful. Yes. Yeah. Stop share. I can see your screen sharing. Yeah, I apologize for this. You, it says you're there. Oh, there, there's your mason jar on soil. There we go. How about that one? I can see it. It's All right. So, so it mason jars. 
it's showing your presenter view though. Uh, Wrong screen. Yeah, let's try that again. My apologies. No at the museum, I have to tell you one of my other favorite things at, about working at the Pasto Agricultural Museum is nothing plugs in. And so we don't have these problems. <laughs> All right, so share screen. Desktop to share. But you say desktop again. Yeah. Let's see if this, I'll try one more time. There's there's a jar and little there you jar. Go. That's good. Perfect. All right. And you just see the jar because you need to look at these up close. These are two quart mason jars filled with soil. And if you look closely at the label on the largest picture on your right, that was collected in 1915. We have some almost 50 jars of soil that were collected in 1915 and 1932. And we understand them to be from the Jordan soil fertility plots, which are part of the university's first large scale undertaking and scientific research to determine long term effects of fertilizer on soil and crops. This is an experiment that ran from 1882 for 75 years. And it's today, the site is where the Millennium Science Center is more or less located. So we're still doing that kind of research, just in a different sort of way. Um, and like I said, as an educator, this is really compelling. These artifacts have a huge history connected with them um, in terms of publications and research. And so we know what kind of tests were done on the soil samples and perhaps on these exact jars. And just last week, my colleagues in anthropology, Laura Weicker, Weirich and in soil science, Estelle Corrado, in a clean room environment, uncapped one of these jars and uh, dispersed it into multiple containers that we are today and this next couple of weeks going to be running several assays to satisfy our curiosity, better understand what has happened over these so over the decades to these soil samples. And I am hoping that we can then use this experience to not only showcase this historical research of the Jordan soil fertility plots, but make an explicit connection to what our scientists are collaborating to do today. Right. So let me stop my share. What other questions do we have? Um, well, the, one of the next questions is, is anything related to American chestnuts would be especially interesting, but native plants in general, e.g. pawpaw, et cetera. The, the Paso is a, in particular a botanical museum, but is there, would you point to anything, um, any other collections for chestnuts and pawpaw and so forth? Well, I, I mentioned that the Xylarium has some work that they're doing with the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, we've featured researchers working on American chestnut breeding programs in our programs at and in special exhibits in the past at the Pasto Agricultural Museum. And I can also share that museum interns, our undergraduate interns that have worked at the Pasto Museum have helped plant chestnut seedlings at the research farm uh, just steps away from the museum. So there's a, there's two in, there nationally there are two programs to try to breed chestnuts that are resistant to chestnut blight. One started at, at State University of New York uh, in 1990, which is generated genetically modified chestnut that produces an enzyme that breaks down the toxin that the uh, um, that the um, fungus produces, and and these trees do really well. But we also have some. The, including the ones you referred to, Rita, that were have been bred by crossing Chinese trees that are resistant and then back crossing them to American chestnuts. And there are multiple generations of those that are that um, provide some level of resistance as well. Um, one of the questions in the chat or in the Q and A was uh, um, Justin was surprised to hear that Penn State University has only the third largest herbarium 
in Pennsylvania? Who are number one and number two? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if Sarah Chamberlain, my colleague and curator of the herbarium is on, um, on the call. Uh, she might be able to answer that better than I. Uh, I expect it might be one of the partner herbariums that uh, she's working on the Megalopolis project with the um, Morris Arboretum. I'm I'm not certain. I don't want to answer for her. I apologize. I think I think that might be number two, Rita, and I think number one is the. Um, Carnegie, the botany collection at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Perfect. That, Thank you so much for your help. That's pretty good. That's, that's a particularly impressive museum, including lots of big bones from dinosaurs 120 million years old. So um, I also want to point out that um, in the college, we're, we have um, hired a, a new faculty member, J Jill Hamilton, is focusing on restoration and conservation of some of these trees like chestnuts and ash that have been damaged by invasive species. Um, one of the next questions that was submitted was what devices or techniques on, that were developed for weed control on this continent were later adopted by old world countries. And I'm not really sure of very many. I can cite you examples of new developments that got started in Australia and have spread here. But uh, I, I was sort of, I checked it with a couple other weed scientists who were a little bit stumped about that one. Um, and I don't have a whole lot to offer in that area either um, in terms of weed control. Um, you know, most of the tools and technologies that we have date from the middle part of the 1800s when plowing was quite common. And so that was a part of uh, weed control, um, but it might have also hampered that. Um, and so, you know, techniques and, and devices changed over time. Um, we do offer um, some programs coming up uh, with the Master Gardener uh, Demonstration Garden that is located at the Russell Larson Agricultural Research Center. Uh, we'll be featuring our Master Gardeners in walk and talk workshops. And one of the talks scheduled for the fall of 2023 includes a weed walk. So we'll be able to identify those weeds and uh, discuss in the home garden some of the um, techniques that you might use to manage those. Um, you, must have, you must have some um, ancient hose and things like that in the Pastor Museum. We do have some. Um, our collection does not include a huge selection of home small garden items. Um, over time, our collection has evolved as really focused more on agricultural production. And so we have, um, well, we do have a potato sprayer, which is quite large, um, and some potato and corn weed uh, mechanical devices. Oh, okay, so there's some things there. Some okay. things. Yeah, um, one of the next questions, and again, no, maybe not so directly related to the museum, what has been the role of glyphosate in Penn State University's agricultural history and and it's that would that would follow pretty much what the history has been of glyphosate and use across Pennsylvania, really around the world. It was first commercialized and developed in about 1974 to 75. Um, it became a major component of no-till agriculture in the United States and in Australia because it could be used as a burn down treatment, and then people could plant the crops immediately afterwards without tilling without tilling to control weeds. Um, in a, the first herbicide resistant, I, as a personal note, I was present when the first herbicide resistant, um, glyphosate resistant weeds were discovered. They were in, discovered in Australia, reported by an extension agent named Jim Dello near Sydney. Um, but then by 2010, glyphosate resistance was particularly common in lots of areas. Um, genetically modified crops that were resistant to glyphosate were uh, commercialized about 1996. But some of the resistance developed quite independently of that. Um, so the, the, the key points that um, the or weed science team would emphasize is that uh, glyphosate still remains pretty important as of great value in supporting no-till agriculture, um, in which Pennsylvania is a leader in the country with about 70% of the um, farm area in no-till and about another 35% or so in cover cropping. So 
there's a there is a history there where we've been very much Penn State's been very much involved in it, but it pretty much matches in parallel what has been the national international trend. Um, so, uh, Rita, what is what do you, what do you have in the way of lumbering memorabilia in the museum? The question was, what is your content of lumbering? Yeah, so we hold several artifacts related to timber and lumbering, highlighting early 20th century hand tools that the woodsmen might have used, uh, as well as the tools that foresters might use to survey and manage a timber stand. I work with faculty and foresters in the college to offer programming at the museum. And coming up on June 9th and 10th is the biennial Pennsylvania Timber Show at the Russell Larson Agricultural Research Center. So be sure to come out for that. So that's a great tip. Um, the question continued, is lumbering considered part of agriculture by the university? Most certainly. Uh, lots of people, if you ask, what's the biggest agricultural industries in Pennsylvania, they'll say dairy, and that's true, is about $2 billion, or they might say poultry, and that's true, is about a billion dollars in eggs, probably more worth more than that now because of the avian flu knocking out egg production. But the biggest uh, agricultural industry by far still is Pennsylvania's forest products industry, which generates an income of 5.5 .5 billion a year. So it's five or six times bigger even than dairies. And so we definitely think of it as part of uh, forestry within the university, within the college. Uh, the next question was, what musical instruments did Pennsylvania um, farmers play in the 1900s? This might be a question for a music technologist. Um, we don't have a whole lot of instruments uh, in the museum, musical instruments in the museum, but the question might also be asking, did farmers in the 1900s make or listen to music? Did they have fun? I assume that like anyone, they probably did. We don't have objects that describe how farmers entertain themselves, but we know from photographic archives, the USDA, WPA, Work Progress Act, and Extension Service had extensive photo documentation projects in the um, decades ago and uh, captured the families and rural workers listened to the radio. They played the piano. Um, from primary source documents like um, probate inventories or paintings and diaries. For example, we read diary excerpts when we do programs related to the Oregon Trail for fifth grade field trip visitors. And we talk about the objects that were packed in the wagon. And one of those on the list is a piano. And a violin or a fiddle, uh, and families needed to make decisions about how important they were to um, their family and if they were going to carry them all across uh, the 6,000 mile journey. Um, so households might have owned them, uh, and some of these resources are, are what we would tap to help answer that question. So our next question takes us way back, way back before the, the museum. And someone, uh, the question was, what's the oldest agricultural site in Pennsylvania? And um, Mary Seed brought to my attention, there's a place called the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, which is in Washington County, which has been inhabited for 19,000 years and is claimed to be the oldest identified site of human ha habitation in North America. So presumably they, would have had, they surely would have had some agriculture there. Uh, yes, and because many of our um, waterways and uh, woodlands were inhabited by Native people, almost every historical society um, in each and every county might have uh, artifacts from uh, archaeological uh, findings, arrowheads and tools, and so there are definitely agricultural sites across Pennsylvania. Um, going that far back is not part of our history at the Pasto Agricultural Museum. Um, the Matson Museum of Anthropology here at uh, Penn State's College of Liberal Arts might be a good resource to help us uncover that question. So um, what the other another question is what additional artifacts are needed for the museum? We need space and we need staff. Space for collections that we have, 
clean, safe, secure, environmentally controlled space, not just at the Pasto Museum, but for any of the collections that I've shared with you today. And we need staff that are dedicated to the care and keeping of collections, to the support of education and broader impact activities that are a part of what our researchers need to communicate as they share their science with the public. Do you take volunteers? Absolutely. Our website has a, a quick intake form or you can reach out to me. We do uh, leverage volunteers quite a lot and it has been the legacy of volunteers like Dr. Pasto and his colleagues that uh, founded the Pasto Agricultural Museum and helped to preserve the Armsby respiration calorimeter all this time. Okay, so um, one of the people wrote in the Q&A, Sarah said, what is the difference between curated and uncurated? Mm, uncurated, so in the process of taking an artifact or specimen into the museum, we might, bring those in or take, take them into the collection, they need to be formally accessioned as a part of our collection. In other words, reviewed to make certain that they meet the criteria of the collection policy that guides what ought to be in one collection or another. At the Pasto Museum, it's time frame and technology and um, the condition and uh, potential to preserve a particular specimen or sample would be an important part of that. And so to curate that or accession it into the, the collection um, would then um, identify it and um, incorporate it into our database and start to catalog all of its you know, dimension, size, condition, um, and uh, hopefully it would have come along with where it, it's its provenance or where it came from, um, whether it's a natural history specimen or a cultural artifact, that provenance is an important part of being able to use it in further re research and interpretation. So um, another one of the, uh, uh, in the Q&A asked for contact information for the end of the program via email. So in the, in the chat, Rita's email address is given and it's rsg7 at psu.edu. There's also the website for College Connections, which will uh, put you on to being able to see this episode again or pick up information from that. There's also the website for the Paso Ag Museum listed in the chat. Um, uh, Bill asks, is there any chance that you'll be open on the weekends? Uh, we are open by appointment. So if that is the time, of week that would work for you, please reach out and we can make an appointment. We're currently uh, staffed very lightly. Uh, and so uh, it's just a matter of trying to make sure that I'm able to cover the Pasto Agricultural Museum, the Armsby Respiration Calorimeter site and my other responsibilities. So that is to say one of the issues is that the, the museums really are, the museums you've referred to at Penn State are scattered all over the place right now, right? They're, they they're are. In lots of different places. Um, so uh, let's see, Roger asks, what are the biggest challenges facing the museum? Physical space expansion, collection expansion, finances? I think you probably addressed that pretty well already. Is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, well, I, I think in short, it's staff, space, and sustainable funding. Short and to the point, that's right. Um, can you talk about the challenges of preventing damage to the collections while also allowing their use in education? That is a trade-off and something that we are always thinking about because at the Pasto Museum, we are very hands-on. And uh, you know, in, in homage to Dr. Pasto, we want to show people how things work. So we do have a, a motorized belt running some of our historic uh, grain reapers and binders but we run it very cautiously for a very short period and we maintain and lubricate those um, artifacts and run a check very regularly to make sure that they're still in a condition where we can do that. We also have, in addition to our permanent collection, our, our curated or accessioned collection, we use what we call an education use collection. In other words, we might have reproductions 
of a grain mill or a second uh, apple peeler that is not in our permanent collection that we could put a sticky juicy apple on and turn the crank and show people how these simple machines worked um, as a way to illustrate how um, you know technology and invention invention was a part of agricultural life right um is there a map of the museum or a list of displays um this question i looked at the website couldn't find anything like it actually the museum isn't so big that it really needs much of a map but you might might have a list of collections in it i i think it's a good question and just a tiny bit early um i would ask that you visit our website in a few weeks um, we are currently in the process of updating uh, the content that is on that website to not only better describe the exhibits, but also the programs and support resources that we have for our visitors and educators that use the site. So a couple of a uh, couple of com uh, commentators mentioned ask, will Penn State ever host a museum of natural history to facilitate public outreach and collaboration among research ma managers? And someone else says. Any combination of these museums should be a future program for the Ag Council. I think it, one of the challenges is that we would like to have a STEM museum. And the plan is that following the development of the Palmer Art Museum it, near the same site, that eventually there would be a STEM museum put out in the, in the grounds of the Arboretum. So we can hardly wait for that day to arrive. Any other comments about that one, Rita? I think the key there is staff space and sustainable funding and if we could find that sustainable funding part it would make the other two a lot easier here you go um is there any point are there any plans to use the surrounding landscape at rock springs to better highlight the museum's indoor exhibits heirloom plants orchard woodlot etc we already partner with researchers that um We'll do demonstrations on the grounds, uh, forest woodlot tours, and uh, we go out to the cornfield with the permission of the researcher um, so that we're not disturbing re active research uh, to harvest samples when we have high school groups, for example, come in and we'll, we'll spray off the uh, root whorls and examine those more closely. So we definitely take advantage of being in the very center of 2200 acres of active agricultural science research to connect with the subject matter experts and the space um, that features research you know across agronomy horticulture plant pathology entomology and um, water woods soil all of that is out there right um our last question does the museum have information on the historical production and processing of flax hemp and other fibers in Pennsylvania for use in textiles. Thank you for asking that question. We have been working with colleagues in the College of Arts and Architecture, School of Visual Arts, and um, have loaned my colleagues in the Center for Virtual Visual Materials. I hope I have their center name correct. Um, and uh, our education use flax processing tools are a part of their research to better understand how flax, if you don't know, flax is a, a very slippery, tiny grain uh, that was quite common uh, in colonial era uh, homesteads, about a quarter acre per uh, family member might have been planted in a farmstead to produce the fiber that would have been used in uh rope material and and tow as well as uh cloth like linen and um so my colleagues are processing growing and processing flax and uh we're working together to develop some programming that we hope we might feature um coming up uh this spring fall or maybe even at ag progress day so i encourage you to subscribe to our website agsci.psu.edu slash pasto, P-A-S-T-O. And on there, you'll find an email listserv uh, subscription. So make sure you, you sign up. Well, we're out of time. I've got less than a minute to wrap this up. I hope everybody in the audience can join me virtually in thanking Rita for her engaging presentation today. Thank you very much.
Um, next month, we'll be joined by Brian Egan, Bert Stanier, Daniel Schmarsh, Schmarsh, and Andrea Kocher for a presentation high highlighting our equine science program. That's for sense, the rest of us. You can search the PSU Ag College Connections to register for that one and also to view recordings of past College Connection webinars. There was a little bit given about this in the, in the cha uh, chat. Please note that it does take a few days to edit and post the proceedings. So you can come back and look for those. So thanks again for joining us today. And I hope you have a great afternoon. It's nice and sunny and almost spring out there. So enjoy. Take care. <laughs>